Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends and I have here with me today, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> We're coming in hot today. <laughs> oh my word. Okay. So um, those of you that have that have joined at the very beginning, um, thank you so much for coming in quick. You saw the go live notification. This is the very last time we're ever going to talk about Harry Potter. OK, this is my promise to you. We're not doing it no more. I'm done. I'm tired of it. I'm not engaging with the Harry Potter fandom um, in this way ever again. I have I have exercised my Potter demons, I feel like, like I'm done with it. This is the last stream. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to this the last time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we keep saying. And yet, no, this is really the last time we promise. Yeah, for Ooh. real. All right. <clears throat> Landon, what is it that we're talking about today? We're talking about Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, or as we like to call it, Terrible Beasts and how to avoid them. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh I was gosh. very, I was very proud of that joke. It's hilarious. <laughs> and we are going to do the whole trilogy. Okay. So the whole trilogy in one stream. Yes. So. We're not going to, we're not going to force ourselves to talk about this for three hours, for three nope. consecutive streams. If you no, want no, to see no. analysis is on the specific movies, those already exist on YouTube. There, there are fantastic creators that have um, already put that content out. We're going to talk about them retrospectively all together. That's what we did. We watched them back to back. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. And so, and this is basically our thoughts after trying to watch them and think of them as a cohesive whole. Okay. So that's what you're going to get in today's stream. <laughs> the I believe the wording there is perfect. The trying to watch them. Uh, attempts were made. <laughs> attempts. Listen. <laughs> the movies are bad. If you need a review, the movies are bad. The first one, good. The second one, who fucking knows what happened there? The third one, we'll get into it. We'll yeah, we're gonna. That. Okay, well let's let's just jump into it. Okay, because we do have a lot to cover. This is probably the angriest episode we're ever gonna do. Um, but anyway, here we go. Here, here it is. This is um our deck for the Fantastic Boost movies: Terrible Beasts and How to Avoid Them. <laughs> it is rare that we choose on our um on our podcast episodes to talk about something that we both genuinely truly dislike usually we have no we have like some redeeming factors at play in regards to the topics that we talk about like elements that we like of them even if we don't like them as a whole um you know but that is that's not the case here we dislike them as a whole and we dislike almost every element of these movies as well um uh, sorry, I guess. Uh, no. It's going to be kind of a different episode <laughs> today. <laughs> We're not you looking on the bright sorry. side here. <laughs> uh, so, <it'll> yeah. <laughs> All right. It's, yeah, this is just going to be two hours of us being angry. And I think, like, this is because, like, we had talked about at the very, very beginning doing Cursed Child. And upon doing these movies, I realized why Cursed Child would be a terrible idea. Because I would... I would be angrier than I am now. And that's the only thing left. And so I'm just like, I'm glad we're leaving Harry Potter on an angry note because I don't need to continue to feel this way. Nope. I think we're good. We're good with it. <laughs> so terrible beasts and how to avoid them. Let's do yes. our little intros and disclaimers like we like to do at the beginning. Um, this episode will contain spoilers for the entire Harry Potter series. My gosh, if anyone cares about Harry Potter spoilers at this point, like I cannot help you. Um, mm -hmm. if you do, then it is what it is, but yeah, it's, it's not just spoilers for these movies. We are going to talk about the uh, Harry Potter universe in general. So there's going to be spoilers all over the place for all kinds of Harry Potter content, um, that exists because uh, there's a ton of it. So yeah, that's disclaimer number one. <clears throat> Lana, you want to take disclaimer number two? <laughs> yeah, there's also going to be discussion of topics involving discrimination, abuse, homophobia, transphobia, and all the problems of Joanne, uh, Kristen, I think is her middle name, Rowling. Right, um yep. <laughs> because she's a problematic human be being and these movies are even more full of it than the entire harry potter series yep um this is like the the problematic cherry on the problematic cake has these, these i feel movies. like you could have gone 
into this these movies with problematic bingo and gotten a blackout. Like that just yes. would have happened. I think you could totally make a blackoutable problematic bingo card out of these movies. Yeah. Um. And this is this is you know we love problematic shit. Okay. Like probably the problematique, uh, we love it, but not not this kind. No. So yep. <laughs> And then one more final thing um, for disclaimers. We do not agree with Joanne Rowling's abhorrent statements against the trans community. She is a TERF. We recognize that she's a TERF and we do not support TERFs. So for today's episode, just like with all of our Harry Potter episodes, if you would like to um, contribute to us, you know, through subs or bits or whatever, like you're more than welcome to. But we encourage our viewers to instead give that money to um, an organization that supports trans youth. Our favorite is the Trevor Project, but pick your favorite. It doesn't have to be that one. So if you are planning on chucking us $5 today or something like that, we would recommend giving it to um, an organization like that instead for today. Local trans and LGBTQ youth shelters are always a place to go, in my opinion. Yep, absolutely. Um. All right. <clears throat> let's talk about our favorite things let's try to pull it back for a second to be like is there any good in the world of fantastic beasts and where to find them that brought us any level of joy uh was there something and so karen was there a moment of of peace that you were like man that's a good thing out of okay. many bad things. <laughs> so um, Marie Kondo taught me to only hold on to things that spark joy. <laughs> and there is only one thing in these movies that sparks joy for me. And that is the chillin. Specifically, the character design of the chillin. <laughs> and I am remorseful and devastated and just absolutely heartbroken every day that this amazing concept and execution of this adorable creature is featured in a movie that nobody cares about. And so the only plushie in the world of the chillin' that exists is a super highly detailed, custom, super expensive, handmade version on Etsy. This is the only thing that exists for chillin' merchandise because the chillin' is featured in this horrible, terrible movie. Whoever came up with the concept for the chillin' and whoever designed the chillin', chef's kiss. Like, you are just, like, the best artist ever. You are you are here for my heart. I absolutely love you. I am so sorry your work was featured in such a clusterfuck, like, waste pile of a movie so that no one ever gets a chance to care about this, like, adorable, deer-like creature that I just want to snuggle and, like, play with its little spindly legs and pet its little head and and boop its little nose. And, and I can never do that because everything else in this movie is so unremarkable um or just straight up bad so uh yeah. artist who made chillin i love you um i wish a chillin plushie existed i would purchase it but i cannot yeah uh i think that that's something that just kind of brings me a little bit of joy about this is that the marketing department knew that this movie was going to fail. There's nowhere in this world that the company that was producing this movie think that this was going to be a success. Because if they did, they would have made thousands of these things. They would have marketed it. They would have sold it. It would have been on every Hot Topic shirt and in every Hot Topic window from here to California. Mm -hmm. uh if they thought there was going to be any chance of success and there wasn't any like and that would have been a pre that's like the Encanto problem like that they had the where like Disney had the issue thinking that Isabel from Encanto was going to be the beloved one and then it was actually the strong sister that was the beloved one so yeah. they didn't have any merch. So there's all this Isabel right? merch that like and there's I love all... Isabel don't get me wrong but there's all this right. Isabel merch that doesn't sell because most people want the um, other sisters. Yeah they want Luisa, Luisa or they want and... um, Marissa was that the main girl or they want the main girl herself. Uh, Maribel. What, yeah. yeah Maribel but or was, they want Maribel the herself. Big, <laughs> the big thing was Luisa because like they didn't make any Luisa merch mm -mm. because they didn't think little girls were going to be want to be the big strong girl they thought little girls were going to want to be the princess or the main character so they made very little <clears throat> Louisa merch turns out terrible mistake uh <laughs> this that didn't happen like that was the problem marketing literally said this movie is going to fail so we're not going to do anything 
Seriously. I mean, Warner Brothers literally was like, well, you know what? We're going to see how this movie does. We're not going to really do much publishing of it. We're definitely not going to make any merch. We're just yeah. going to see. Um, we're just going to drop it and see. And that's literally what they did. And therefore, I cannot have my dreams of a little cute chillin' to add my fleshy chillin'. collection back there. Um, my my heart is broken, you know. And and the one that I did find on Etsy that's too that's out of my price range, like the craftsmanship is beautiful. Like I think it's wonderful, but it's still not even what I'm looking for. Like that thing is like a a, a display piece only. I want a plushie that I can stick in my cat's face. And that they can, you know, you play with and they can hug it. You yes, want a squish I want like chillin'. a squish mallow chillin' or something of that nature, you know, but um, or a beanie baby chillin' or, you know, but nothing like that exists because Warner Brothers had absolutely no faith in this movie. Not that it deserved their faith, to be clear. Um, they were right to have no faith in this movie, but still, but still, the poor chillin, one of the best magical creatures in the entire Harry Potter universe totally robbed of any popularity because of being featured in this cesspool movie. Terrible. Yes. Awful. So that's Terrible. my favorite thing, the chillin'. <laughs> Landon, and what's your favorite thing from these movies? I will die on the Eddie Redmayne Hill. And the reason being is because this man delivered us neurodivergent anxious autistic snoot scamander which is everything i feel the harry potter world and universe needed was to be like yes it turns out autism does exist in the he just like world me for real <laughs> he i was like man that one spicy <laughs> brain is spicy <laughs> and i see you <laughs> <laughs> And I and I loved it. And I think Eddie Redmayne did a fantastic job making a lovable character, even when the script was shit. Even at the moments in time where it was like, man, I don't care about Newt. I cared about Newt because Eddie made amazing choices in his character and development that I just fell in love with. And having just this dork being lovable and cute and hyper fixating on magical beasts and just being a ball of fluff. Perfect. Perfection. I mean, uh, New Scamander brought me joy. You're right. You're totally right. Because if I think about the third movie, the worst movie, the first time I watched it, I came away with like the only scene I actually remembered and, and had any real interest in where it, when he goes and saves his brother and they have to like yeah. crab dance out of the pit and I was like that was I couldn't even tell after the first watch I couldn't even tell you why his brother was in the pit I could not remember but I remembered not going and yeah well I mean obviously I've watched the movie a couple know. of times now and so I know but at that time I couldn't even remember why his brother was in jail in the first place but I remembered Newt going in and saving his brother in the cutest most silly way possible and I just like was like he's so cute <laughs> he's so cute he just liked me for real and just like me. <laughs> and like just knowing that, just knowing that man, this boy hyperfixated hard on magical animals, and that's why we're here. Just so nice. <laughs> and I do think that this is a testament to um Eddie Redmayne's acting. Oh. Sorry. Okay, let's go and back. I'm trying. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so I do think this is a testament to Eddie Redmayne's acting because you can just see in the second and third movie, he's trying so oh, hard to get you to believe that he's the main character and his character should be here, even though he literally shouldn't. Um, nope. We'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> but he's trying very hard to sell it to you. And he does this, the best job he possibly could, I think. He yes. does the best job he possibly could. And yes. So I am very thankful and grateful for Newt yes. Commander and Eddie Redmayne's commitment to making this character as he should be like in a diverse character choice even for a white man mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I yep. appreciated it it's good it's good um I I mean I I agree like literally this is the entire list of good things in these movies these two yes. things if you this liked other it. things in these movies um then congratulations <laughs> But I really, literally can't think of anything else I liked. 
I was going to be like, you should get your taste buds checked uh, if you liked other things. <laughs> well, you know, it's okay if your palate's not very refined. We, um, you know, uh, I, I wish sometimes that mine were not and I could just enjoy things better, but. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so, yes, right. this was our favorite things. So, in case you either luckily have not watched Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, or if you don't remember the clusterfuck that is this movie, I have a concise and not at all resentful summary for you of all three movies. So you must stand by as I try to summarize all three movies and as entertaining and educational as I can. All right, Landon, regale us. I'm ready. Okay. The story starts with quirky Newt Scamander as he makes his way from U- uh, to the USA from England in the early 1920s to return a Thunderbird to the wilds of Arizona, which one of my favorite sayings from all of the movies, by the way. <laughs> but due to some sneaky nifflers and then occupancy eggs, a briefcase gets switched and the magical beasts that Newt has smuggled into the country are let loose in the chaos of New York City. Meanwhile, American Aurors are confused as their part of their city is demolished by a beast that they cannot identify. As a result, the nomad or muggle community is in an uproar and a group of second Salemers have tried to convince people that wizards are real and dangerous. One of uh one of these boys of or one of these second Sam- Salemers is a young boy that has been uh hoisted into the group. Uh, is Credence, a very abused orphan who is being manipulated by an older man who promises protection and freedom from his abusers if he does what that man says. Harry, I mean Credence, is very worried that the magical things that are happening cannot be controlled. And Aura Graves, the man controlling him, encourages him to continue to seek information about his siblings. On the other side of the city, Newt is on a wild chase with the help of his muggle friend, Kowalski, and witch sisters, Queenie and Tina. And after much hijinks, the creatures are collected only in time for Newt to be caught and charged with the murder of a political figure assumed to be caused by one of his beasts. Tina is sentenced to death for her involvement and Kowalski is, uh, is forced, it will be forced to forget. Queenie saves the day by rescuing them all. Newt discovers that it is not one of his beasts that is responsible, but in fact an obscurial, uh, a creature made from the wild magic of a wizard child that is forced to hide their magic and has suffered abuse because of it. Turns out, Credence was the monster all along, something Graves did not see coming. And when Credence goes all nuclear, it's up to everyone to try to calm him back down. But as the Ministry does, They attack first and ask questions later as the Obscurial is destroyed without hesitation and they kill it. Quote, unquote. Graves is revealed to be Gillert Grindelwald and is uh, a terrorist from Europe and is arrested for all of his terrorist attacks in Europe. The Thunderbird is freed in the wilds of New York City, calling down rain to cause all of the non-magical people of New York to forget what has happened, including Kowalski, who in the end opens his bakery, making beautiful pastries of magical creatures he seems to remember from a far off dream. Beautiful story. But then, fast forward a year. (laughs) Grindelwald, while being transferred to Azkaban from the American prison, uh, escapes. Dumbledore enters the scene, seeing uh, seeing this is some way to start the next, or that this will be some way to start the next great war. He takes his influence over an impressionable and neurodivergent young boy, Harry, I mean Newt, and asks him to join the cause. Newt calls upon Queenie, who has been keeping Kowalski drugged because she loves him so much. Honestly, the movie is just so boring. All you have to know is that Newt and his brother Theseus are in a love triangle with Lita Lestrange, who is Newt's best friend from school and Theseus's fiance. She ends up dying, though, so the brothers come together in her memory. Grindelwald is recruiting followers in France, including a not-so-dead Crevance, who is alive and searching for his lineage in Europe. For a good part of the movie, you think that he is actually connected to the Lestrange family, but it turns out he's actually a Dumbledore. And how he is related, 
uh, we will unfortunately find out in the third movie, and it's not nearly as cool as all of the theories that we thought how he was related were. <laughs> also, Kowalski isn't going to marry Queenie because she's magical and he's not, and that's against the law. And we discover that Dumbledore can't attack Grindelwald because they were closer than brothers. And in the end, Grindelwald escapes and is recruited, is recruited lots of people, including Queenie. But Dumbledore has suddenly garnered the power to be able to destroy him. One day might be able to destroy him directly instead of using third party manipulation. Fast forward another year. That's literally the entire second movie. <laughs> Fast forward another year. Duh, duh, who knows? They don't give us an actual timeline. Uh, Grindelwald is freed from all charges. <laughs> and in the same year, supposedly, runs for office. Everyone is really mad, especially Newt, because Grindelwald's people killed a super rare de- deer thing called a chillin. But the chillin, that was pregnant, had given birth to twins, and one went to Grindy who murders it and then brings it back to life with necromancy, and the other goes with Newt. (laughs) And then, man, these movies don't make any sense. Anyway, Credence is trying to kill Dumbledore because he's angry and related to him. Uh, Grindy knows that uh, that Credence is being used, or Dumbledore tries knows that Credence is being used by Grindelwald and tries to convince him out of it. It's revealed that Credence isn't Dumbledore's brother, but in fact, Aberforth's son uh, that Aberforth didn't know about and had apparently abandoned prior to everything. So secret son happened. That was on a bingo card somewhere. (laughs) In the end, (laughs) Grindelwald convinces the Wizarding World to choose to you choose the next Minister of Magic because apparently the entire Wizarding World is one government question mark by letting the chillin decide because it was an ancient tradition they used to use and they do that by using the brought back to life chillin that Grindelwald controls but it turns out that they figure out that uh, Grindy killed the chillin and brought it back with dark magic uh, so everyone gets really angry. There is a brief fight, direct fight between Dumbledore and Grindelwald, and then Grindelwald leaves, and the chillin chooses Dumbledore to lead, who is like, no thanks, bro. And then I stopped paying attention to the movie. Uh, all all three times that I watched it, I stopped paying attention to the movie because that's literally the end. I, I think... Queenie and Kowalski get married after they're yeah, reunited. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, not really. Okay, so the couple <laughs> of things at the end to wrap up all these plot lines that it, it's very hard it to remember because the, it, third, <laughs> the third movie doesn't make any sense. But yes, Queenie and Kowalski get married. Okay, Tina, who is absent from the third movie, and the reason and she's absent is because... Second. Yeah, most of the second. The reason why she's absent is because the actress... Wouldn't um wouldn't be quiet about how terrible J.K. Rowling is. Wouldn't stop talking about how awful of a turf she is. So she got she got fired basically. Mm-hmm. Um and so she shows back up and her and Newt get together officially. Uh, Credence goes off with his dad Aberforth, right? And uh, and Dumbledore goes off to be headmaster of Hogwarts. That's also, that's all the ending. Oh, the chillin. Also, Credence- when Dumbledore says no to the chillin, the chillin says that's cool, bro. And he goes and chooses the other politician anyways. Whatever. And also, Credence doesn't go off with Aberforth because Credence is actively dying because the Obscurial is killing him inside of him. <clears throat> yeah, but we don't so, really like, get we, a resolution on the Obscurial part. No, of it. so we just literally see Credence passed out, looking on the verge of death of Aberforth's hey, arms, and don't hear anything else after. Yeah, that. yeah, we don't know if he survived. We don't know if he's living with Aberforth now. We have no idea. We just know that him and Aberforth connected. That's the last thing we see. That's all we know. Yeah. Um. It, and like the Queenie and Kowalski, like Kowalski, like relationship, while shipped and adored by many a people, doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, like there's... in the end, they get married. 
yeah there's parts even of it that i think are really... against the law even though nothing has changed even though <sighs> none of these characters have grown there's they're like they just still get they get married even though they said a year earlier they weren't going to yep and well we've got a we've got a section where we'll talk about them specifically so i'll give you all like my opinion on their relationship and for what it's worth i do ship it so but I um think it's cute i like it yeah. it's just so not done correctly yeah i love so many of this stuff in fandom mm-hmm. i wish that the second movie i wish that the third movie had never been made because how fans decided to take the ending of the second movie and just like run with it fantastic was great loved it so much wish that that happened because the third one just literally came in and was like we're gonna dog shit all over this yeah they didn't keep any of the stuff that they set up in the second movie they undid all of it within the first 20 minutes of the third movie and they were like we're just going in a different direction too bad if you liked that stuff get over it it's it (laughs) so this was probably was this the most like of what happened in these movies doesn't matter because no. it's I never never resolved or resolved within five minutes that it doesn't like make doesn't care mm-hmm. like the whole uh, Lita Lestrange thing it doesn't matter like I could have I literally only included her because like I wanted to add a little bit of more to the second movie summary when, and, and but her it death doesn't her. matter no and she, she gets like she she gets introduced and died in yeah. the same movie. She's and, totally fridged. Yeah. It, it... I and mean, literally, she only exists so that Newt's brother has a reason to hang out with him. That's it. That's literally yeah. it. She gets And she gets fridged so that now Newt's brother has a reason to be in the third movie. That's it. I actually, no, I think she actually only exists because they realized that people shipped Newt and Tina and wanted to add jealousy. <clears throat> They could have, but see, Newt never. Like, I, because I also don't think Newt's brother, Newt's brother, doesn't need to be in the movies at all. Mm-hmm. He doesn't no, do anything. Everything that Newt's so, like, brother does, Tina could have done. Yes. So I honestly think that, like, Newt's brother, like, like Letta, because she had like a super quick. There was like a super quick photo of her in the first one, and there was tension around it that she literally is brought in to make Tina jealous and like have a jealousy of this relationship because there's a whole thing where, where a mi- there's like a misprint of of yes. Newt saying being <gasps> oh, called yeah. the fiance. Mister Scamander is how he's referenced to, but it's like a picture of Newt and Letta. So like Tina thinks that they're together and that the connection that they had a year ago didn't matter, like. It's a whole thing. And like, that's literally, it's to build romantic tension. But because Tina is cut from so much of the second and then the entirety of the third movie, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because like, we don't feel any, like every, anything that exists, exists off screen. Yeah. They have three scenes in the first movie and then everything is off screen. So this was probably the most challenging summary for you to write, wasn't it? Oh, I think A, because there's three things, and B, because none of it actually matters. Yeah, so how do you know what to include and what not to include? Like, yeah, there's context that I guess is kind of important-ish, but not really. Like, yeah, Yeah. it's a whole thing. So let's talk about why that was. Like, why was this? Because there's a whole, let's let's talk about the history because we like to do this and go into like what was going on in the market at the time. So let's talk about like why that was. Why was this summary so challenging? Because there are reasons that you can't really explain what's going on in this movie. Um, And it's, it's 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 very interesting. I have to say that the, the, the series itself was set up to fail. Like it had everything working against it. So yes, let's do that. Let's talk about it. A winding yep. road of bad timing and money making greed. Mm-hmm. So we start in uh I believe it's 2014-ish, where the love of Harry Potter novels have continued to skyrocket. The movies have stopped coming out, um, but the love of Harry Potter is continuing to go. Uh JKR is still making bestseller records, she's still <clears throat> making lists. Uh, it's being published in an incredible amount of languages, and people love the the first the first uh, theme park that came out. People Universal loved Park, it. yeah, I was gonna say yeah. Universal Park. 
in Florida was officially built and then greenlit in uh, and started being built in California and Japan. Um, so all of a sudden, like huge amount of success. And then at the same time, JKR's pseudonym is leaked. So she is discovered to, instead of been writing Harry Potter books, she is writing mystery novels under a separate name. And those books are not doing well. They didn't do well at all. But by, like, as far as we're aware as the public, not by her want, it is leaked that she's writing these novels. Mm-hmm. So it's not all like of a this sudden- is like. It's not like this is a secret. It just like wasn't no. super common knowledge. So it went from yeah. being like something that you would know if you specifically looked into it into something that like everyone in well, the Potter fandom knew. The publishing world knew, but it wasn't even like right, like fans, like not even fans, but like readers didn't know. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yeah. a secret amongst the publishing community and the market and the world there, but it wasn't out to the public. Right. Like she was writing under a pseudonym because she did not want to be connected to J.K. Rowling. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So her pseudonym is leaked and this puts her two books that she publishes on the bestseller list because mm-hmm. all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, we love J.K.R. We need to sell it. So all of a sudden she goes from like not being successful in her in her uh, writing mysteries to being very successful. Yeah. And at uh, this time, remember, this is in a post wizard shitting themselves world. Yes. So there is this like little contingent of people that are getting kind of tired of JK Rowling in the Harry Potter fandom. And when these books all of a sudden get very popular, there's like murmurings of like, what a weird pseudonym to pick. Do you guys know who Robert Galbraith is? And it's connected to her turfery. And, um, and so there's like these murmurings at this time of yeah. like, what the heck? Why is that her pseudonym? Um, you know, but it's very, it's not like very loud yet. You would only be hearing these if you're really in the Harry Potter fandom and you're following a lot of Harry Potter fandom uh, accounts that also are already annoyed with her for like the Dumbledore is gay post Mm -hmm. thing, the wizard shitting themselves thing. Like you guys know, because we've talked about this. So, so that's like starting to bubble up at this point. I also think that there are like feelings there that exist within the fandom too, of like wanting to support her on going out on doing something else Mm -hmm. of being like oh we're excited to see what jkr is going to do next what is the next harry potter all those kinds of Mm -hmm. things and then upon reading her books discovering that they're not yeah there's hope there's like hope there and then people read it and they're like and they're like oh these aren't that good (laughs) forgiveness i think for certain parts of the fandom to be like oh of course she's done with harry potter like so she's of course she's making these stupid comments of wizards shitting themselves and like adding all this stuff because this is also a pre- uh, a Pottermore world too mm-hmm. so like she's so of course like this is happening she's done with it she wants to move on so there's like a support there and a hope there as well mm-hmm. so her pseudonym is leaked and Warner Bre- Brothers then green lights about a year later a standalone fa- uh, ba- film based off of the epistolary novel which is it's kind of an epistolary novel it's it's a textbook novel it's a textbook within the book series and it's written in the form of a textbook so it's not a narrative story that it's being based off of but turning it into a narrative story called fantastic beasts and where to find them mm-hmm. so and people are very Warner excited is- about this because yeah. the magical creatures is a very popular part of the harry potter fandom so when we first hear this we're kind of like hopeful we're thinking like mm-hmm. oh this could be great there's going to be another harry potter standalone movie And at this point, when it's greenlit, we know it's going to take place in the U.S. And then what we've been told is that um, if this does well, there might be more with other locations. But they're not necessarily part of the Fantastic Beasts, like, as a series of movies. Like, that, it's it's more like, oh, if this standalone movie does good, we might do more standalone movies. It's kind of the impression that we're given by the press release for this. And this is... This is also when it like turned into the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Like they they started doing it, it, the official brand hadn't turned that way, but they had started referring to it as that. Mm-hmm. That it's like, oh, this is the this is the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, not you know Harry Potter. Really trying to focus on building out the brand to not just be included of Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. So then, hey Kendra, movie. <laughs> Hi Kendra. <laughs> so then the movie begins production and Universal Harry Potter the theme park sets amusement park records so not only does all of a sudden 
like they've greenlit things, but then the two other parks open and records are blown out of the water. There's continuous mass sales. Basically, uh, Universal Studios, which is the theme park that the wonderful world of Harry Potter is like follows under, uh, is now a competitor of Disney, which it never yeah. had been prior. It was and I will tell you, separate thing that wasn't in the Disney category. And I will tell you guys know I love theme parks. Okay, you guys know I love theme parks. And the two Harry Potter theme parks that exist at Universal are some of the best theme parks I have yeah. ever been to. And even if you're not a Harry Potter fan, um, if even if you just like theme parks, like I would recommend them. They are excellent. They really do give Disney a run for their money. Like that's not a joke. That's like, that's not like just like blowing smoke. Like they, they're like truly good. Like the butterbeer at the, at the universal park, y'all, it haunts me. And I have dreams about this thing. It's so good. (laughs) Thank you so much for the lurk and hello, Koneko. Hi, Koneko. Um, yes. So, uh, and, and they've also decided to build a secondary park in universal, um, Florida. So they've they've been building Hogsmeade. They then green light to build um what's it called? Yeah, Not so there's Fox Universal. Ternally, so but... in in Orlando, there's Universal Studios, which has the first Harry Potter world, and then they also have a second part called Islands of yes. Adventure. So Islands of Adventure also has a Harry Potter segment. Um, and they're both connected. So yes. like they didn't both like they both they're in the two separate parks. So like it's kind of genius from a marketing perspective. You got to buy a ticket to both parks to see all the Harry Potter stuff. And there's like if you can take the Hogwarts Express between them, there's like a train. It's like it's really cool. And it's um, great. It's great marketing. Um, <laughs> it's but great. it's it's then it's built to do that. So mm-hmm. they're not only building more and <clears throat> and doing record setting that way, but then all of a sudden they're building on the stuff that they already have so people would go back to them yeah and the thing is is like when you see the theme parks and you experience them and and like at the time before fantastic beasts came out i had visited the theme parks and i had thought they were so good Mm -hmm. that there for me anyway there was a lot of hope around like oh what's next for the harry potter franchise maybe it really could grow up and become something that's like a really big tentpole property you know like a star wars or something like that I also think the thing is, is like because so many other companies and so because it's becoming so universally large and we had the information that JKR was trying to move out of the Harry Potter universe, there was also this idea for the fans that were angry at JKR but still loved Harry Potter that maybe she wouldn't be as involved, that it would be a very Lucasfilms sort of thing, that it would be mm-hmm. an oversight rather than an individual hand on the heartbeat sort of yes, thing. Yes, that's what we thought. We thought it would be like, you know, because when it comes to Star Wars, sometimes like Lucas really needs to not be as involved as he is. And we mm-hmm. just thought like it would be that sort of thing. Um, oh, so my face is covering this and one. Then... Hang on. Let me show you guys. Boo, boo, boo. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. What? Oh, the, what What you just showed next on oh. In text. Oh, oh, no, you guys. It. Uh, it begins. It begins. <sighs> Joanne Rowling's turf tweets ramp up. So prior to this, she had been liking stuff. There had been an incident where she liked something and then unliked it. Like it was very covert. It was obvious that she was exploring these realms and agreed with these ideas, but she hadn't gone public with it. And after movie production began, so after casting and filming and all of that is set in motion, she starts actually tweeting. And it was very and disappointing. This- it was very mm-hmm. disappointing because before then, her publicist had said stuff like, oh, well, she doesn't understand. You know, she's old. She doesn't really get Twitter. And then once the tweets, the actual tweets that she typed and the quote tweets that she was doing, not just likes and replies anymore, it became obvious that that was absolutely a lie. She knew what she was doing. That was evidence of her falling down the rabbit hole. And unfortunately, um, nobody pulled her out. So she became a turf, straight up. Yep, straight up, and and went public with it. Yep. So then, in order to cover up the disaster that JKR was was really doing, news broke fairly soon after that Warner Brothers greenlights a five movie deal for the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. 
Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is already in the pre-production phase. It hadn't begun filming yet, but it certainly had started its pre-production, which means that they had a director, they had a script, and they had people cast for it. And then all of a sudden, Warner Brothers is like, hey, you thought you were getting one? You're actually getting five. Mm -hmm. And we took this to mean that like, wow, this movie must be really good. We're really super excited for it. Um, you know, that, that was kind of the, what this led us and to believe was, in the fandom. There was excitement. And for the most part, because the turf tweets had started, like, she didn't go on the rampages that she went today. It was one or two tweets. It was, it was small. So a large majority of the franchise or lots, lo- large majority of the fans didn't know that this was going on. And in order to block headlines from being made, Warner Brothers, like, like released this idea almost like to protect their image and the face of Harry Potter by trying to distract you from what JKR was doing. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, it also still felt like that there was a major separation happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So then a little while later, Fantastic Beasts one premieres. Mm -hmm. And it's at this point in time too, that we realized that Joanne Rowling is not just overseeing at a, name sort of level that she has actually written part of the script that she is hands on with this so she goes back to what she said two years prior as far as not wanting to be involved in harry potter and directly directly negates that and at least from my perspective in the fandom um we totally at this point, we're like, okay, well, she was obviously lying. Because here's the thing is there was always murmurings at this point. that, like, yeah, J.K. Rowling says she wants to be done with Harry Potter, but she can't let it go. And there was lots of evidence to support this in what she was publishing on Pottermore that she just can't let it go. Uh, mostly because, like, nothing else that she makes is half as popular as Harry Potter. And we believed, based on, you know, the fact that those books, the the mystery books were not that good, that they they probably wouldn't be. Harry Potter was probably the only popular thing she was ever going to make. Um, yep. And so, like, th- those of us that were, like, following her a lot and really, like, paying attention to what she was doing, we were like, oh, yeah. So her wanting to get away from, from Harry Potter was just hopeful words on her part. She never, ever meant it. She was always going to go back to, to Harry Potter because, in reality, what she wants is attention, of course, like all yeah. of us. Or, and like, so, all of this, you know. yeah. Or maybe yeah. she did mean it at the time, but then all of this good stuff that happened mm-hmm. within the universe that she was very hands off of. I like to think it was hopeful. Like she wished yeah. she felt that way, but she did. I think that that's and I, and I and I also think that and I my and I can also see a world in which she did think she meant it, and then she wasn't su- successful. And on the other hand, being passive in this world did mean she was successful. And so mm-hmm. why would you try? Fa- why would you try at something that you might fail when the success was guaranteed? Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's where it was. Fantastic Beast One premieres. And uh it, so Fantastic Beast One premieres. Um nothing big happens. It's received well. Things are good. They don't actually I think most of the fandom liked it. It was different, mm-hmm. but most of the fandom liked it. It was entertaining. It, it, it felt though like, okay, how the heck? Are they going to make five movies out of this? Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And that's the biggest thing that happens in between then and then. Like, biggest thing that happens is just wondering how they're going to make five movies out of this. Do you There's remember? There's no drama. Do you remember, like, in when the first one came out and, and we all watched it and the fandom was kind of like, oh, there's some really cool ideas in this that I hope Mm -hmm. that they carry over, such as like the way apparating is portrayed in the first movie, Mm -hmm. the way that in the US, a lot of the um, wizards lean a lot more heavily on um, voiceless spells where they don't speak any incantation. They just do some kind of like movement, right? So there's like all these kind of like really interesting ideas in the first movie, but... Like, and they do leave you like this weird cliffhanger so that, you know, a second movie is coming. But most of the fandom was like, I just don't get it. Well, I just don't yeah. get how this is a series. And and 90% of like, it didn't feel like a series. And I think that like, when you, when you scroll out and you see the order of things and go, oh, they had already start, they already had a script. They had already been greenlit and had a script and started pre-production. And then Warner Brothers said, make five, which means that they never intended when writing it to make five. And they had to do last minute scrambles in their pre-production phase 
to figure out how they were going to tie this to a big five part movie. Mm -hmm. So it feels very last minute and it feels very secondary because it is, it's not the integral part of the plot is not based on the fact that this is going to be a series. Mm -hmm. So things are great. Fantastic beasts to filming wraps. Uh, you know, JKR is doing her thing. There's a lot of unhappiness in the fandom. Pottermore has flopped at this point. Uh, it's rebranded to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter rather than Harry Potter uh, or Pottermore at that point, too. Um, but, like, for the most part, nothing big happens. Yeah, there's kind of, like, two camps forming in the Harry Potter fandom at yes. this point. There's, like, the camp of people that are, like, the old-school Potterheads, and you'll find a variety of opinions at this point about whether you should still support Harry Potter or not. There's a whole gamut of it. We've talked about it in previous episodes. But then there's this other little pocket of Harry Potter fans forming that aren't old-school Potterheads, and really what they are is people that like that J.K. Rowling's a turf, and I like to call them pretend fans. I don't know necessarily that they are. Like, I don't know. I'm not deeply involved in, like, turf communities or anything like that to really know, but they're people that were, like, they aren't Harry Potter fans because they read it as a kid. They're Harry Potter fans because they like the turf shit J.K. Rowling is tweeting, and yeah. they realize that if they support Harry Potter, it kind of gives J.K. Rowling this idea that she's right and she should keep tweeting, And right? Exactly. So there's kind of these two camps forming at this point um, in between Fantastic Beasts 1 and 2. So then, after filming, the op-ed is published accusing Johnny Depp of abuse. Now, I want to make Did y'all remember here, about this? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make clear here, we're not here to discuss anything about this. Just truly stating things that have happened. So Johnny Depp is accused very publicly in the height of Me Too of abuse against his, at, at that point in time, ex-wife, Amber Heard. And Amber Heard has come out and published to a uh, magazine or to a newspaper stating that Johnny Depp has physically and sexually abused her. Uh, after it started, after Fantastic Two wrapped. So like, yeah, like it's done. It's, had a, already, it's done. It's done. They're editing done. it. It's they and can't redo it at this point because there's a reveal at the end of Fantastic Beast One that J that Johnny Depp is Grindelwald and that the majority of Beast Fantastic Beast Two is going to be about Grindelwald. We know that Johnny Depp is going to be a large player in the movie that is already wrapped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in the moments, it's probably a week or two after. Uh, Amber Heard has come publicly. Disney drops Johnny Depp from all future projects, and Warner Brothers drops jo Johnny Depp from Fantastic Beast movies of the future. Mm -hmm. So, and this even is really contentious. Him, yes. But this is really contentious at the time because J.K. Rowling comes out and says, "Like, I do not believe this situation is as cut and dry as you guys mm -hmm. say it is. I'm friends with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Like, it's more complicated." he shouldn't be dropped, but they drop him anyway, right? So but this is him. like a really contentious decision. And the fact that we haven't seen Johnny Depp as Grindelwald except for about 30 seconds at the end of movie one, but we have an entire movie coming out in which he's going to do it, knowing that he is then going to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them premieres. <laughs> and it's a shit show because we all go into it <sighs> Knowing that fantastic, like knowing the whole drama, Johnny Depp drama, uh, trying to figure out how this is like, this is really going to make or break the series. Like, this is how we're going to really tie it in together. This is how the fans are going to suddenly understand why, <laughs> what part this plays in a bigger story. Also, how are they going to keep the Fantastic Beasts and also make this about Grindelwald? Because the movie is about Grindelwald's secrets. Well, fans have a huge problem with it there's a lot a lot of problematic issues with fantastic beasts and where to find them number two uh let me start by saying the queer baiting that existed within the movie oh at this God. point in time prior to any of this jkr has come out and said that grindelwald and dumbledore were were in love dumbledore is gay and in the movie uh the only sort of like reference to it is this idea that Dumbledore and him were closer than brothers. It's so, so there's stupid. a lot of queer baiting so that's existing. It's super queer baity. It's um so and so stupid. it's kind of 
and re- and remember, like this, as we're kind of going through these steps, mm-hmm. J.K. Rowling's turfiness is like ramping up and ramping up and ramping up, like as it's going. And so, like this comes out, we get the brothers line, and literally everybody that's on the the haterade train, myself included, I remember being like, <laughs> "Told you so, told you so, told you so." I knew <laughs> since the wizards shitting themselves, told you so, um, and, that this is the she's garbage. <laughs> and all of those who weren't suddenly signed up. Yeah, uh, we also have the problematic. Uh, the problematic storyline of Nagini. Mm-hmm. I didn't even mention her during my during my summary because honestly, her storyline doesn't fucking matter in the grand scheme of the of the Harry Potter series. But what happened is J.K.R. took a uh, old folklore of Southern Asian uh, history and gave it to a South Asian woman to be a be a person, a beautiful woman who turns into a snake over time. And in order to connect it to the larger world of Harry Potter, ended up being the evil snake that would later then help the fascist leader, Voldemort. So she did kind of the same thing. And we'll talk about this more when we get into it. She did kind of the same thing in this little pocket realm that she does to like the U.S.'s magical community overall. Mm -hmm. She took like a few stray things um, that she understood about Southeast Asian culture and folklore and mythology And applied them in ways that showed that she only did surface level research on the area and its folklore. And so it upset everybody. It upset everybody. Which (laughs) is not new for her. Something that she did very common and actually is part of what made Harry Potter wonderful. The issue is is that what she took was British and her culture's uh, background and history and the things that she knew. Mm -hmm. She took Anglo-Saxon sort of... um, religion ideas told folklore there really really stuff that she was connected to that wasn't harmful she, because she it's her culture so she knew harry how potter to do books. it properly it was her culture she then all of a sudden in harry potter or in fantastic beasts and where to find them because she's doing the greater war- world took other people's cultures and, and she didn't know how to adapt did, it properly. And did the same level of research that she did with her own culture, but because she didn't have the context, the depth and understanding, ended up making something incredibly insulting <clears throat> and racist, yep. especially in terms of uh, Nagini. Yeah, so Nagini's storyline, basically everyone hates it because either you're saying like, oh, it's racist, or you watch it and you're like, why is she in this movie? She doesn't do anything. So nobody liked that. Hello, welcome in, John. <laughs> hey, John. And then also around this time, Johnny Depp has filed his first lawsuit against Amber Heard, where he has dropped public proof as to the fact that he did not abuse her. That, yeah, that, so now that there's is like what a, he was claiming. So there, so there is a big like he said, happening. She, she said with that yeah. um, in that situation. But, so So now there's like, so now Johnny Depp also has a bunch of people that are like, Johnny Depp on his side versus mm-hmm. anti Johnny Depp, and that's a whole. Well, cluster. and also, and also, in the first time in the Me Too movement that this was happening, because the Me Too no. movement was happening during this point in time, mm-hmm. uh, Johnny Depp is the first man that has been accused of uh, assault and sexual assault and uh, abuse to respond back with allegations and proof of that not happening. That in fact, Amber Heard abused him. He's mm-hmm. the first one of a high profile level to have done that and to have kind of brought proof to the table. So what that meant is that all the people who didn't necessarily want to believe in Johnny Depp or that Johnny Depp had done this thing had all of a sudden rallied behind. And yes, it was the he said, she said, but also there was a whole like this then spun off a whole movement within the Me Too movement itself and Johnny Depp kind of being the face of that. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, uh, there is a lot of anger over the fact that Johnny Depp was fired from this project when he seems to have been when when the media is saying that he had been falsely accused yep um <clears throat> so all three of these things plus a not good movie <laughs> like ended up in disaster yeah exactly it was such a mess exactly kendra like there's not a single thing going right in this production no <laughs> not a single thing fantastic fantastic beasts and where to find them was great the everything started working against after filming for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them too, Because the next steps after that is several... So Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them dropped in November of 2019. And uh, pre-production began very quickly after that for Fantastic Beasts 3 because, again, they had a five-movie green light deal and COVID-19 hits. 
Now they have a panini on top of all of this. All they all of a sudden they have a panini. So they have started the very beginnings of filming. They hadn't started filming actually, but they had started site sourcing. They had started cut. They had started you know all of the stuff that they needed to start. They had casted the new characters. They like cast new characters. Uh, <clears throat> COVID nineteen drops and stops everything in the world to a halt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and everything is put on pause uh, for nine months. Yep. So not only did they leave a bad taste in fans' mouth with the unhappiness of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them too, but they couldn't fast light a movie to get something out to put a better taste in their mouth. They couldn't yep. wham bam get it done because there was literally no possible way to make anything new from happening. So fans for nine months stewed. On mm-hmm. their anger, as JKR's turf tweets continued to ramp up, as not only is she like dropping, she's dropping her own op ed during this point in time, she's dropping yep. false information. All of those things that happened during COVID are happening, are like that JKR did bullshit during COVID, are happening on the heels of an incredibly bad situation with Fantastic Beasts 2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> So what does Warner Brothers do? They <clears throat> announce that they aren't going to make five movies. Yep. So they say Again. this third one's the last one, you guys. We're going to wrap it all up. <laughs> what? They don't even say that. They just say that they're not, they have not greenlit five movies. Mm-hmm. That the third movie is still happening, but they have been very vague about how many there's going to be because Warner Brothers did not want to commit to five movies in case the third one failed, but also didn't want to write themselves out of four or five movies from happening in case there was a bounce back after COVID-19 and after the third movie. So here's what we understand from what I believe are credible sources of these conversations happening in the Warner Brothers like executive rooms, right? And I and I believe these people that that mm-hmm. that say this like former Warner Brothers uh, employees at the time basically are saying this. So essentially what Warner Brothers decided is like whether Fantastic Beasts 4 and 5 gets made is purely going to be based off of the reception and box office of Fantastic Beasts 3. If we make a fuck ton of money, okay, we'll make the other two. If we make this third one and everyone's like, we love it, thank you, we'll make four and five, right? Um, so so that's essentially the conversations that they're having in the, in the executive suite. But an important detail to remember is at this point, the script is already written mm-hmm. for third. They have mm-hmm. already cast characters Mm -hmm. they have already started the pre-production and finished at this point the pre-production because that's all they could have done in the nine months of COVID-19 yep so they're just waiting to be able to film (laughs) they're waiting to be able to film and Warner Brothers announces that all of a sudden there's a chance that the fourth and fifth movie are not going to be made Mm -hmm. which means they no longer have the guarantee of telling this story through multiple movies. They have to wrap up this series or and also leave it at a place where it would be satisfying for it to continue. <laughs> so they have to go back and do a shit ton of rewrites while also, as far as like we're aware, keeping the same contracts, which means the people that they have been contracted with and the actors that they have hired need to still have jobs um, or else they're just going to have to pay out of pocket. So they have to keep the same characters. <laughs> they have to uh, have a lot of contracts as far as like where things are being filmed. Uh, they have to kind of keep the same essence of it and also put five, three movies worth of plot into one and also leave it open-ended enough for it to continue on literally impossible literally impossible. It, it, the impossible task <clears throat> and so without anybody's surprise having looked at all this fucking mess fantastic beast 3 premieres and utterly flops nobody liked it the, nobody. no the movie is a mess <clears throat> warner brothers knew considering the fact of this it was cursed to start uh the money greed of overpromising movies and then also protecting their image by dropping Johnny, which I'm not saying is the right or wrong thing for it to do, but do yeah, not. Like, just to, but just then to say also, it again for anybody that's joined us in the last yeah. few minutes, we are not expressing an opinion specifically no. on Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's situation. It's a complicated mess. That's literally our only opinion. 
It's yes. just it's relevant to what happened. But with it is movies. it is relevant as far as like <clears throat> dropping dropping Johnny had a huge effect on it, not backing anything up and kind of staying silent while fan and having the problematic bullshit happen that happened in P- Fantastic Beasts too, and then having to sit with it for two years. Yep. So Fantastic Beasts three flops, and as far as Warner Brothers has come out. There's not going to be any more movies. They, they haven't come out and confirmed that. It's still up in the air, but because of the of how much of a mess it made, there absolutely will not be another movie. It's not. There won't be. This was the last one. I'm I'm sure of it based on the things that they have said. And I even saw recently that they, this is so funny considering the last, you know, the last Harry Potter stream that we had, they floated the idea of like doing mm-hmm. a remake of, of the Harry Potter books, um, you know, because at least people like those. <laughs> So we'll see if that's the next thing, because the thing is, is Warner Brothers does have to keep making some kind of like a movie, TV, something content, yeah. because just the theme parks alone is not going to allow them to keep their license. They have no, to keep the, producing content to keep that license. To keep, the, to keep the copyright, to keep the contract, and then also to keep the theme parks relevant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like they still need to advertise something for why people would want to go to the theme parks. The theme parks are amazing, but remember they're in the scheme of making money. They're capitalism, so they want to continue to grow. They do they I have a feeling Warner Brothers hates the fact that Florida is the only campus slash theme park that has both Diagonale and Hogsmeade. They want to continue to expand. They want to open up in other places. They yeah, want but- to continue to make more money. They yep. want to compete with Disney. And they can't do that if they stop making things. Mm-hmm. So more Harry Potter content will be made by Warner Brothers. I guarantee it. But Absolutely. it will not be in the Fantastic Beast branding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no. Uh, I think another standalone is more likely to happen than another reboot. I know Karen yeah. is very believable that a reboot's going to happen I in think the next the five years. Happening. I think but I don't, I think it's too soon. So, can you run through the wall like at the train station? You actually kind of can. You, you, go, you go around this yeah. corner, you kind of do run through the wall. <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> it, so, that was a lot. So what we want to do is we want to take a rare opportunity to rank the Grindelwalds. We want to la- add some levity to the bullshit that we just went through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So because of how A, it was written, and B, all of the fucking drama that happened, we were presented with three amazing Grindelwalds. We have <laughs> Mads Michelson, we have Colin Farrell, and we have Johnny Depp. Colin and there Firth, are arguments. Almost. Colin, Colin Firth, Firth father, whatever. I keep Farrell, doing it too. Colin. That's why I point it out. Birth. No, that's yes. Farrell. Oh, I, and we Farrell. wrote it wrong in the notes then. We wrote it wrong in the notes. Okay, it's Farrell. Farrell, okay. Farrell. No, okay. Farrell is, is Darcy. You're right. Pride and Prejudice. You're right. I was reading both, the notes wrong. Both brunette white men, but mm-hmm. still. <laughs> um. So, uh, we want to go through and talk about what we liked and disliked and which one we liked the most. And yeah, this will be fun. Uh, we, have, we have differing opinions. <laughs> uh i so karen who who do you like the least let's start there okay so my least favorite Grindelwald is johnny depp okay and this is why and this is why i think at this point i was already tired of johnny depp because he plays the same character over and over in like all the tim burton movies right and i was just kind of like over him and then, of course, there's all the drama between, you know, him and Amber Heard. And um, and so then I'm watching the movie knowing that he's not even going to be in the next one. So, like, why the heck do I care? And, like, for me, for me, I am trying to imagine Grindelwald as, like, the one guy that Dumbledore pulled, right? Like, the one guy that pulled Dumbledore, right? The one, The one guy that's, like gonna make um Dumbledore concentrate on romance as opposed to you know uh running his school and being a teacher and things like that right and Johnny Depp just has this kind of like little bit of goofiness to him Edward Scissorhands yeah I mean he played Edward Scissorhands like over and over and over for years and years and years and eventually Mm -hmm. I was bored of it and so I'm just having trouble imagining um this version of Grindelwald 
um, you know, charming Jude Law's version of Dumbledore. Like it's it really just literally comes down to the the shipping part of it for me. Um, and it's not helped by the fact that I'm bored of Johnny Depp at this point anyways. So that is my least favorite Grindelwald. And before we go farther, Landon, who is your least favorite Grindelwald? <laughs> Bad writing. Bad ac- acting, an accent I couldn't understand. Mads Michelson. I know people love him. He was great in Hannibal. I understand that he is a town favorite. He had no charisma and charm. I was like, this man was supposed to charm the entirety of the wizarding world. And this man could not even <clears throat> get anyone to be on his side. <laughs> He is, he is a brick wall, and I hated it. <laughs> Great actor, hated him for Grindelwald. True, and it's it's so unfortunate because of the way that everything happened. He got absolutely no time to mm. connect with the audience. Like he literally got the worst script of the three to try yes. to to try to work with. Um, I think it's, so it's very unfortunate. I think it's 100% bad act and like bad writing, not bad acting. I think Mads did what he needed to do with what he had. He didn't have time to have charisma and charm. He was constantly threatening in the, scre- in the script. He was constantly having to be like, no, we do it my way because that's what was being written. Mm-hmm. I think that, that he he was set up to fail, not because he was bad. Uh, but man... <sighs> He just, I, I wanted a Grindelwald who char, like, because that was the thing about Grindelwald. Voldemort ran by fear. Grindelwald ran by f- playing on people's fears, but also because he was charming and smooth. Mm-hmm. And we just didn't see it in that. Yeah. And I mean, even though he's not my least favorite Grindelwald, um, I can totally see all the points that you're making. Because if you think about like populist, fascist leaning, um leaders in history they might not all be like charming okay but they are all entertaining okay everybody wants to sit down and see what the heck craziness trump is gonna say next okay and it is true that when it comes to mads's grindelwald there is not a huge entertainment factor that helps you understand him as like this charismatic proto-fascist-esque European leader. Like, there's nothing about him where I would be like, oh man, I want to see what he he has to say next. You know, there on no level. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I, and it was, I mean, it was written into the Harry Potter series that Grindelwald is charming, that he is all of these things of the charismatic leader. And, beca- and yeah, it just, he just didn't do it for me. Not that I necessarily so number, believe Johnny Depp does it, but like at least, at least there's reasons does I could see. It. <laughs> at least I, I can see why people. And would here's like that. the deal too for me is that I have to remember that it's not this Johnny Depp and this Jude Law that would be like hooking each other up. It's <laughs> 16 year old Johnny yeah. Depp and 16 year old Jude Law. And are you telling me that these two twigs wouldn't be attracted <laughs> to each other when they thought they were the smartest people in the room? Come on now. so so with that being said then we both kind of agree on who the best of the three is which is colin yes yes johnny is my favorite no colin's the best one okay here's why colin has the gravitas for the actual like um, political stuff that he's proposing. We'll talk about the politics in just a minute. So hold on that. I know what I said. It isn't exactly correct. I get it. Anyway, he has the gravitas for that piece of it and also has the charm. Like he's decent. I really don't like that they changed. I mean, and I know that the second change changing from Johnny to Mads like wasn't really super avoidable, but changing from Colin Firth to Johnny Depp was totally avoidable. You did not have to write it in the script that way that like he was hiding his appearance or whatever. Okay. You didn't have to write that. I wish they yeah. would have just kept Colin. Honestly, I, I wish they would have just kept I, Colin I, and let him continue to play with that role. I think he would have done interesting okay things. That. I think they had, I think that Colin as Graves was not Grindelwald. Like that's the other thing too, is that Colin wasn't Grindelwald. Colin was another character. He was pretending to be that person. 
So like Colin wasn't Grindelwald. He was pl- he was pretending to be Graves, who was already entrenched in the like in the universe and who he was. So the only time we really saw Grindelwald out of Graves was when he was reacting with Crevance, which I do think that he did have the Those charm good scenes. and the nuance. They were good scenes. They absolutely were. Uh I would have been okay if if Colin had stayed on. Uh but Johnny had, Johnny at least like knew how to perform in front of a crowd. And I know I mean, that I you're tired really, of Johnny. I can't but... really disagree. I'm just but I'm just bored of him. You know, I'm just bored of him. Like that's fair. I, I think to. it was I think it was also a choice of putting such a widely known face as the actor, as the character, because it's just so the antithesis of what the Harry Potter movies have always done. Like mm-hmm. Maggie, Maggie being the like biggest um star and alan i guess you could call alan rickman I would as say, well yeah maggie but smith and alan, alan rickman but, were big but stars. maggie smith was always a subtly big star and is also older mm-hmm. and alan rickman they put him in a fucking wig like they changed <laughs> they changed him mm-hmm, in a way did. that he was able to get into the character you look at this you do look at this uh grindelwald and see johnny depp Oh, like that's yeah. the other thing too. That's Johnny. But th- <laughs> it is Johnny, but I'm like, man, that's an interesting like that's the other thing too of like, oh, this is an interesting guy to look at. This is an interesting head of the movement. This guy? He's just some guy. <laughs> oh my god, mad but lovers, I, mad lovers hate it. <laughs> that's fine. They can come after me. But here's the real tea. You ready for the real tea? I'm ready for the real tea. I'm ready for the real tea about ranking the Grindelwalds. Hit me no matter of these three who you choose, you're wrong. Because these are not the best Grindelwald. <laughs> Jamie Campbell fucking Bauer <laughs> is the best Grindelwald of all time. <laughs> he was in the original Harry Potter series. He's attractive as all get out. Uh, he shares the last name with me, which I'm like, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh the best, Gr- the best Grindelwald. Also, I don't think he even Dumas has any lines. I don't even think he has more, any lines as Grindelwald. Uzma <laughs> had more chemistry with the reflection of this guy than he did with any of the others. <laughs> Thank you so much for the and applause, he- Kendra. Thank you so much. Landon Thank can you. live another week now. <laughs> this joke, <laughs> when I came up with this joke, I was just like, can we please do this? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I totally is- agree. I t- the truth is, is that they really, in, in all of these movies, they really didn't t- take the time to think about like who Grindelwald is, what do we know about him already in yes. canon, why, like, why are people interested in Dumbledore and Grindelwald um, and their story anyway? They didn't spend any time really thinking about it mm-hmm. from that perspective. Um, and so we end up with all of these portrayals none of which truly hit it on the mark um except for this one little look right here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from Jamie Campbell Bauer who there somehow is, like, knew <laughs> just knew didn't have to say anything and was the correct Grindelwald <laughs> oh Jamie. Jamie oh Jamie just Jamie. <sighs> yes so he, this actually the fact that he like made his way into Harry Potter and also Twilight I was so sad that he wasn't able to sneak his way onto Hunger Games somewhere because I'm like man Jamie Campbell Bauer had it all that would be the trifecta the trifecta the fandom trifecta Truly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh an Anakin Skywalker absolutely and now I don't watch it but he's like also in Stranger Things yes so I'm like he really truly is in the peripheral of all fandom his character and in Stranger I, Things like by the way he's really good in his scenes in Stranger Things if you haven't seen it it's also, called eyebrow acting he is, he is an amazing eyebrow actor he also <laughs> was in a fantastic musical called Sweeney Todd yeah he's good in Sweeney Todd too all right so now that we've had some levity, let's get back to the spot the problems. Well, actually, first, we're going to do an audible recommendation. Woo, 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 woo. Okay. Um, inner stage window. We love audible. Okay. Um, if you uh, if you like reading and uh, audiobooks and things like that, we highly, highly recommend um, audible. Um, that's what I use to read most books because I'm too busy and I read too slow. 
And um, and if you would like to start your free trial of Audible, it's audibletrial.com slash interstagewindow. Your first month is free. And even if you only do the free month, you are supporting us. But I would recommend keeping it after the free month because it is truly just a good service. So that being said, Landon has an Audible recommendation for us today. As always, as you know, I'm a sixth grade teacher, which means YA is my wheelhouse. Uh, and I was thinking of like, what kind of magical beast book do I know? And I was like, you know what? I just recently read this one. I actually also recently watched the movie. And it's such a good story that I wanted to bring up Life of Pi. Uh, I think that there is a lot of wonderfulness to do with the story. So Life of Pi is about a young boy who is being forced to leave home uh, where his family owns a zoo. And they are being forced to leave to go from their uh, home in Southern Asia to go to California. Um, and tragedy strikes <clears throat> when the ship that they are on uh, capsizes in a thunderstorm, in a storm, and sinks. And Pi, a young boy, uh, finds himself in a life raft, in a in a lifeboat with several animals but mostly a tiger to keep him company and it's a beautiful story of a magical journey of a boy and this tiger as they try to survive one another and survive this terrible terrible place that they have found themselves in uh and it's a story that will make you cry and question and has i think one of the most gut-punching sort of like, like realizations of metaphor um, the ending is for, really good for young kids, but also yeah. for like adults. I think that it's one of those books that you read as a kid that reading as an adult changes your life. Um, and I 100% recommend it to anybody who can read this because it really is the story of of survival on multiple different levels. And I would say and, this is one of those stories that, like, even if you've seen the movie, there's still a lot of value in reading the book as well. Yes, uh, and it's pretty short. Mm -hmm. It's only, it's pretty short on both physically and also on Audible. So go ahead and download it on audibletrial.com slash window to listen to it for free. Yeah. All right, Landon, I'm so sorry. I have to, I have to pee and I can't hold it no more. So if you want to get started on the next section, I'll be like right back, like two seconds. I'll be right back. Uh, oh, you were, uh, um, Kendra, that's a good, that's a good thing to know. You were assigned to animations class. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it has a lot of things there. Um, I haven't, I've just recently read it. I think I might make my sixth grade. Oh, no. Am I too far away? Hello. Um, I think, um, uh, I might make my sixth grade read it next year. Or this year, I don't know yet. Okay. So, as Karen is finishing up her little break, I will tell you guys all, hopefully my audio is better, better. Um, that this is just going to be a big old episode of Spot the Problems for the rest of the time, because we have talked about how much we dislike it, so now we got to be specific with it. Uh, these are all the things wrong with Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Not all the things, actually, just, just the bare minimum, but we didn't want to be here for 15 hours, because... We couldn't be. <laughs> we picked our favorites of the bad things. Uh, Karen, Karen, Kendra was saying my audio is fuzzy. Does it sound fuzzy to you now? I have to hold no. my mic closer. No, it doesn't. Just to make but sure. Hopefully, that will fix it. Um, okay. So, okay. the first thing that we want to talk about is the fact that this is largely set in America, and there's three things that have been invented for basically the American interpretation of the Wizarding World. So there is Makuza, which is the Magical Congress of the United States of America. So basically, it's kind of like this the America's magical government. Okay. Um, there's Ivermorny, which is the American Magical School. And then there's the Second Salemers, which is a group of um, muggles that have some kind of awareness of the wizarding world and are incredibly against it. Like they... They, it's like a conspiracy theory kind of group, right? So these are these are all invented now for the Fantastic Beasts movies. Um, some of these came like partially from Pottermore and some stuff like that, but they're like expanded on here in these movies. So we've got these three mm -hmm. things now in the Wizarding World um, because America exists in the Wizarding World in a deeper way. 
I think so. that what this really, these three facets of things that have been created sums up is really JKR's not understanding of how uh, a the history of America, but also the culture of America. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this was a flaw because a huge amount of her uh, fans come from America. Mm-hmm. America is one of the highest selling places of Harry Potter. Obviously, we have two of the parks. Like, this is a mistake to not understand American culture and American history. And I think the the one that absolutely pissed me off the most. Uh, was Makusa. Mm-hmm. And uh, the concept that in the 1920s, America, that was still under the laws of Jim Crow, would have a Black president of the United States, the mm-hmm. magical United States, mm-hmm. uh, is a slap in the face to any person of color that comes from America. That is an absolute... Like, and also it, like, cause here's the deal. P Pe- like people of color can exist in films and in positions of power without having to explain why they are there. Uh, however, if you're going to do something that is going to take history, such as World War One and World War II, and not take the ugly parts such as racism and the utter like disrespect and horrid behavior we had towards people of color i got i guess uh, especially in the 1920s I got Ooh, snacks. they'll make it better so so here's the problem right the problem is not necessarily that we have a black president in the 1920s for the magical world and that's not believable like that's not really the problem the problem is no. that we also have this racism allegory in the movie where Queenie and um, Jacob Kowalski are not allowed to get married and that's supposed to be the stand-in for racism and we're supposed to believe that that the U.S. is still racist, like I'm putting quotes around that because it's the allegory part of it, and yet they're not bigoted in the way of actual race, okay? But we know that that's not how bigotry works. Bigotry no. tends to co-mingle <laughs> and go hand in hand. And if we are still having struggles between magical and non-magical people, there's also going to be hierarchies between races, between genders, um, between uh, socioeconomic classes, all of the things that we have already in the world. Like those aren't the magical community is not immune to American history or American society and is just going to be like, oh, we're super progressive in regards to skin color, but we're not progressive in regards to magical and non-magical ability. Like, no, bigotry works together they are co-morbid yes. with each other and this is just a fundamental misunderstanding of bigotry yeah and you go and also i think like it's a stark thing to go from a scene with second sandlander second sandlanders which are protests against a certain kind of person in this case it's magical people protesting uh or non-magical people protesting magical people but also like has lots of fascist sort of underlines to go from that to then just being like hand waving a black, a black woman president, by the Mm -hmm. way, (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. the important part too, of like being like, Oh yeah, this exists. Mm -hmm. And then when questioned JKR just was like, Oh, racism doesn't exist in the wizarding world of America. I mean, you're exactly right. Koneko. Do we expect a bigoted writer to understand how bigotry works? Absolutely not. No, We don't. But the problem is, is that we have gone from um, novels explicitly written for children and young teenagers to now films that are supposed to be four quadrant films that are for kids and adults and everyone in between. And so when you've got this story that's clearly supposed to be a four quadrant story that our adults are supposed to be able to engage with as well, and you see things like this, like it's just, it just is glaring in a way well, that isn't wasn't as glaring when you were a kid reading Harry Potter. Yes. And I I also like there is no surprise that bigotry exists. But I am not going to lie that I am a little shocked that a movie of 2017 with where we were in the world of 2017, certainly not nearly as like vocal as far as progressive as we are now, but that nobody and the entire making of this film was like, hey, is this a good idea? Because <laughs> we are going to piss people off with this. 
we are going to piss off by insinuating that in the era of Jim Crow, that a black woman president is a believable thing when we are still using history of that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that nobody sat there and was like, hey, this is probably not a smart idea, or mm-hmm. at least didn't have the hindsight to like come up with a statement to address it. Instead, mm-hmm. just sat there and was like, oh, we're hand waving racism. Mm-hmm. Am I shocked by this? Absolutely not. Am I incredibly criti- critical about this? Yes. It's disappointing. It's disappointing. It, it's real. It's expected, but it's like frustrating. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, no, that's not how that works. Yeah, it's very, mm-hmm. it's very annoying. Um, and it only gets worse, right? It only gets yeah. worse when you look at Ivermorny, where she did the same thing as she did with Nagini, where she was like, let me look at some, you know, various tribes of Native American folk tales and and things like that, and and that's what we'll use for our folklore for our American magical school. Okay. This is stupid for so many reasons. First of all, what that means is the American magical school existed before colonization, and apparently colonization had no effect on it. Makes no sense. And the fact that there's still only one American school is like, do you know how big America is? There would at minimum be an East Coast and a West Coast one. This makes no sense. Like, no American believes that this makes any sense. Well, also, and also, like, it's this idea of, okay, the school existed before colonization, but the type of magic practiced exists in the roots of, and exists only in the stories from people who are colonizers. Yeah, like no the sense. type of magic and the idea of magic wands and the idea of like magic rooted in paganism is a hundred percent a European like place where it's it formed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. magic that exists from different places in the world looks nothing like the magic in Harry Potter. The Harry Potter magic in roots can be easily traced to certain aspects of paganism and uh, different like areas of of European magic, but is nowhere near any sort of African magic, no form of Native American magic, no form of any sort of folktales of of Asian, Eastern, or Southern Asian magic. Like, so, yeah! (laughs) It's so stupid. It's so stupid. And the other other thing is, and I don't necessarily know if this was Um, this was probably just an oversight, um, but because we have just the one magical school that existed before colonization, what that means is that J.K. Rowling is basically saying all the Native American tribes are the same thing, right? Hey, and like, that's like super racist. Like, let's just, let's just call a spade a spade. Like, that's just super racist. Like, even if the magical school had, had been a Native American thing that existed before colonization, um, and colonization didn't change it, even though that makes no sense. But even even so, there would still be like multiple, sc- excuse me, schools because multiple different groups of tribes would, you know, have banded together for the schools. And then other ones would have been like, we're going to make our own school. And, you know, like those sorts of things would have happened. Makes no sense. Yeah. Makes no sense. Well, and I and I have a theory about this. I don't know <clears throat> if I've shared it, but I won't today because we already have an, a long stream. But um the, the concept also of, like, tying it back to the Makuza and the anti-racism, are you saying that in the age of slavery, uh, slaves were just invited to come to Ilo- morning Because they didn't so. believe in racism, so people who were enslaved people could just, children who were enslaved could just go to morning I guess so. I guess so. Or are we saying that because morning because also there's this intense idea of no madge and madge, uh, and magic users that like no one with any sort of muggle and industry was was allowed in which mm-hmm. means that no one who came here that wasn't already born into the wizarding world such as people who were enslaved or, or like such as like people who came who were stolen and came to america that way because they were enslaved because they weren't originally from America, they couldn't be a part of. Like, there's just so many. It doesn't make ways sense. And this then, doesn't make sense. It doesn't and make I, any and sense. I, and then you make it even slightly complicated, where it's like, okay, well, what about people that were like in a pseudo slavery, like an indentured servitude type of thing? Because that wasn't just Africans. That was also a lot of um, 
you know, uh, Irish people and things like that. Like, what about that population? What, what, how did they interact with the magical world? But I, basically what it boils down to is like exactly what Koneko was saying. Like, they just forgot that this happened in the real world. Yes. They just like, yes. they just were like, whatever. It, whatever. it didn't really happen in the real world because you couldn't have. It doesn't make any sense. And it's Koneko, absolutely, absolutely uh, it gets overlooked. But also we'll say that like specifically JKR never said that racism doesn't exist in Europe, Harry Potter's Europe. They, she did say that it doesn't exist in in Fantastic Beasts America. So like there is like at least with that you can sit there and be like, oh, she's she just didn't think about it. With this, she's purposefully annoying ignoring it and ignorant mm-hmm. to it. Yep. So what essentially that ends up with is JK Rowling's American Wizarding World doesn't look anything like mm-hmm. what any of the fandom had created for an American Wizarding World up until this point. Um, Because remember, like, we've had years and years and years with this franchise to be able to create our own ideas and fandom, which many, many people did. And so then what you end up with is this situation where literally every fan is like, "Um, we already made all of this better and yours is really stupid. Well, it also cut out any possibility of spinoffs. Yep. I don't want any Harry Potter at this point in time, like not even now, but also when I first watched the first fantastic beast movie Mm -hmm. i never wanted another harry potter story to take place in europe because i knew that it would just not understand any or not europe sorry america because i knew that it wouldn't understand any of the nuance of the united states of america even europe to be honest like seeing how seeing how little jk rowling did research for both the both america and for southeast asia i don't think she should touch continental europe either she probably wouldn't understand that either (laughs) and i but like but like i'm talking i'm looking at it from the point of view of me having watched the first film Mm -hmm. and like where i was i was still all in on harry potter in 2017 like i hadn't really been aware of the turf tweets i was still all in there and so, like, even as an all-in, die-hard Harry Potter fan, I didn't want anything to exist anywhere around here. Mm-hmm. And then, as it continued, as the Nagini storyline came to light, as obviously J- I was educated and JKR is a terrible human being, I certainly don't want her touching anywhere <laughs> because she doesn't understand any of it. Yep. Yeah, Koneko, I would be curious, too. I have not gone back and looked at the Fantastic Beast textbook as part of this, um, the movies were enough content we didn't need to. So, um, but I bet well, you there's some things in there that are kind of weird too. Yes, but a lot of these, but a lot of those things that like didn't have any narrative to it. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of the, and a lot of the creatures that we've seen in the movies weren't in their original books. The majority of the original books were based off of names that we had already learned about and car- creatures we had already learned about in the Harry Potter series. Mm-hmm. Because it's a 50-page book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of it is made up by, like, scribbling and writing. And, like, I think Basilisk is, like, five pages of the 50-page book. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, yeah, go, Paneco, go ahead and that's do that. Basically, that's basically what, um for most people, um what their, what their situation was. Okay. I would like then to go to the next piece because this is a pretty big chunk. I, can I also just mention the second Salem Mars very quickly? Oh yeah, yeah. We can talk about more about. I, that. I think ahead. that it's an important. It's, I think it's just an also important like thing to like note that this exists of like the antagonists of the film are the protesters that are being treated badly by the protagonists of the film so no matches the idea of non-magical people are cut out and considered less than in america uh they're racist against non-magical people but our main antagonist like that we have told been told are people who are like protesting against magical people it, there just is a lot of like uh, reverse racism sort of things being <laughs> it is being kind like, of if we're, being if, we're like to, if we're gonna here. buy in <laughs> yeah if we're gonna buy into to the allegory that's being presented then yeah there is like this weird like fakey reverse racism thing going on too it's it's really like strange. we're being told that we should side with newt and the magical people of the world because the non-magical people who are being 
oppressed, for lack of a better metaphor here, uh, are are protesting violently against them. It's just, there's an interesting thing that exists mm-hmm. with that. And I'm, uh, no, I'm dropping that seed. Let it, like I'll let it plant. That. I'll let it plant in your mind, <laughs> viewer. <laughs> so, um, no. And these second Salemers, to kind of like segue into the next thing, these second Salemers are kind of just this remnant of when the movie was a standalone movie that didn't yeah. have any sequels, right? Because they are a huge political force in the first movie. And then afterwards, it's like, they just disappear. Never totally mentioned disappear. again. Like Colin, Colin uh, not Colin, shoot, Credence goes off, right, to go find, um, to go find his birth parents. He doesn't care about anybody that he met when he was in that second Salem or orphanage. He doesn't care about the sister that he had because they're not blood related. So whatever, forget about her, you know, um. So they just kind of disappear. They just kind of disappear, even though there's this like this force, this huge force in the first movie. But that's Stupid. kind of how the politics just work in this entire series. Is that, oh, there's something that we didn't close or something that we didn't refer to or anything like that. We'll just ignore it. We'll just wash mm-hmm. it away. We won't mention it again. And you'll forget about it. And it'll be fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. the second Salemers, who are supposed to be this big, huge issue never mentioned again it's like this yeah it's Mm -hmm. (laughs) um (laughs) but then we also have like several other inconsistencies that i want to talk about with this uh of like um well so one thing that they do throughout the movies it's okay i'll start the first one so one thing that they do throughout these movies is that we have newt come in who's a magic zoologist and they kind of like force him into being a cop. And it felt yeah. very strange in the movie when it was happening. But as I think about like Harry Potter overall, it's almost like, oh, J.K. Rowling, this is just what she does to her era- heroes. You know, Harry Harry becomes an aura. <clears throat> Newt, she kind of like, like plot steamrolls him into being a cop, mm-hmm. even though like, and he says he doesn't want to, but then he's kind of like forced. It's very, very strange. Um, like why, and Tina, of course, she's part of law enforcement, which is fine. She's yep. introduced that way. And, um, we, int- we see Newt's brother who comes in. He's already part of law enforcement. Like, but she's also, Tina is also supposedly like the representation of, it's very interesting how they handle mm-hmm. American cops versus European cops too mm-hmm. in Aurors, mm-hmm. because Tina is almost represented as the only good one. Yeah, she's like the good cop. She's the good <laughs> cop. Uh-huh. Cops are corrupt in the first book. Orders yeah. are corrupt. And we see that with Graves ending up being Grindelwald. But the ministry is corrupt and is is too strict and too all these things and too violent. And Tina is the good person. Tina mm-hmm. is the good cop. Mm-hmm. It presented that way. And then in Europe, all cops are good. All orders are good. Because then we're presented with the idea of uh, Newt Commander's older brother is a war hero who is now the head horror and is amazing and good and kind and has never done anything wrong in his life. And why can't he just be more like his brother? It's like so it's so maddening because it's another thing where it's like J.K. Rowling just has never, ever studied the things that she is writing about because it's like it's almost like she watches the news and she knows that we have a lot of violent cops in the U.S. Mm-hmm. because it gets on the news. And so she's like, oh, well, let's have some bad cops. And we'll have our main cop character be the good cop. Um, but she doesn't fundamentally, like, understand why that happens or how it happens or what it means. Because if she did, then we would have bad cops in the aura ranks, too. But we never do. And it just it makes no sense. And what that causes is um, <clears throat> this situation that it doesn't get to play out because Tina gets kind of written off where um, Tina's storyline kind of like makes no sense. Like she's constantly getting in trouble, but then mm-hmm. they like let her back in and then she gets in trouble and they let her back. It, like, it's just this movie like wants to, wants to understand that like there, there is a high likelihood for cops to become corrupt and how cops band together with each other. And it never, ever follows through on any of these ideas that it kind of like teases us with. Never. And I think it's because JKR 100% loves cops. She must. She must. She must. Every It is a goal for everyone to be a cop. 
Harry was a cop. Ron was a cop. Uh, Tina was a cop. Now Newt is a cop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um. Yeah, and like acting out said a lot, and it's it's just really interesting too. Um. And then we have <laughs> also something that's like problematic with uh is like the politics is also in the third movie we have this election happening um prior to Grindelwald getting nominated we had two sides to a political call for the minister of magic yep which... so we have the, the main candidate guy who I can't remember his name right? it doesn't matter and then we have Santos who's the popular one and then we have Grindelwald who has just started his campaign right and there is a lot yes and then there is a lot of tension and chaos and violence like we see rioting happening it's really interesting because we are not privy to anything that's going on in the political scene at all we don't know what's wrong with political europe at this point Mm -hmm. the ministry of magic we do know that there are hints of like the world war existed and so like europe is trying to pick itself up after the muggle world war Mm -hmm. um and so that there might be some effect that's happening there but we have no idea other than grindelwald escaping and causing terrorism we don't know anything that exists in the world war like it, it, so all of a sudden there's this <clears throat> visceral important race happening to elect a minister of magic where people are getting into fights and screaming and shouting and it seems like there's so much tension around this election and we don't know why yeah i'm sorry for the static you might guys i don't think it's landon i think it's twitch i think it's twitch um because i can't hear it um but y'all can clearly hear it but i can't So I'm really sorry. Um, Yeah, so when it comes to these candidates, essentially what we have is we don't know what the grievance is that Grindelwald is coming in to kind of satiate, right? So I'm going to use Trump again just because he's a really easy recent example of a politician that's kind of fashy, right? So Mm -hmm. Trump comes in and he says, um, hey, you know, economic times are really hard. I recognize that the economic times are really hard. You guys are really struggling to make enough money. You know, you have to work multiple jobs, whatever. It sucks. I have a solution. I think the Mexicans are stealing your jobs. Okay, we're going to build a wall. All right. And that's how they all do it. Okay, that's how they all do it. So the way that these kind of like super right leaning figures become popular is they they know what the grievance of the people is and they provide a simple Solution. It's a false solution. Obviously, y'all, the Mexicans are not taking our chops. That's just crazy. And and even if they were, a wall wouldn't fix it. But this is what they do, right? So what is these people's grievance? We have no idea. What is Grindelwald proposing to solve this people's grievance that's made him so popular? We have no idea. All we know, all we know is is that he's the bad one. That's it. Yeah, we've seen him talk individually or to groups of people about issues specifically queenie right he talked to queenie about the laws in america of not being able to marry marry no match too strict and like i love this aaron burr sort of approach to grindelwald where he has different promises to different groups of people mm-hmm. very very fashy like that makes a lot of sense um, and people are rallying behind him because he's char- charismatic and he's made them promises that are like niche to them. Even if they contradict with other people, it doesn't matter. He's promised us. And so we're doing it. We see that a little bit with Grindelwald. We don't see it on a grand scale. We only see that he's like using fear of a second world war that is incoming to like add hate against the not the muggles but we don't see anything else and we've seen like that that needs to be like we need to have stricter laws and we need to consider these guys second class citizens because of that the other piece of the politics in the third movie that's really really frustrating is we know that santos is the really popular candidate we have absolutely no idea what None. her politics are. All we know is that she's super popular. And at the end, when Dumbledore declines the chillin', she is now the one the chillin' chooses instead. 
So I assume that means that she's like the, I guess you could say, Labor Party, right? The left-leaning candidate. But because these are not addressed, we don't know. Why is she so popular? What about the other guy? The other guy that was like, oh, we should let Grindelwald win. I mean, I would assume, or let Grindelwald run. I would assume like he's the the classical liberal person because his opinion that we hear is let Grindelwald run. If we don't, we're going to have riots, right? So, and that is actually, that's a political opinion that he states. That is the only Mm. time we hear any of the candidates like actual, like a specific political opinion that's like their true opinion um and so what you end up with is this movie that's supposed to be about politics where you come away going wait but what politics where were they like that is the important thing to remember is that this third movie is supposed to be about politics at its very core it's a political intrigue movie uh where we learn nothing about what is happening what anyone stands for or what anybody wants Which is so confusing. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. It makes no sense. And it 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 makes you not care. Like there is nothing making you care about the the only reason that like I felt like fans didn't want Grindelwald or people who watched the movie didn't want Grindelwald to be in charge was A, we know that he was a criminal who just Mm -hmm. got off on charges. And B you know that he's bad because you've read the Harry Potter books where he's been mentioned as a as a terrible dictator. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Wait, this is so interesting. Okay. Before we go to the next section, yes. <clears throat> Koneko has another um a nugget from the Fantastic Beast books for us. Oh fine. The kobolds, this is from the book. The kobolds are constantly marked as contrarians. That's very interesting considering the anti-Semitic roots of kobolds. So um, so that's a little interesting thing. Just more of stuff not That's, being really thought through. You know, just like the just, goblins in the original Harry Potter. Part of me wonders if she just, like, Googled D&D characters and then <laughs> made her own things. Because I'm like, kobolds are also very contrarian in D&D, too. No, and D&D uh, has a lot of problems with that sort of same thing. Oh, yeah. But it's, like, I. it's just interesting to see where I'm like, where did she get her ideas? Especially Probably D&D. Like Probably D&D and Lord of the yeah, Rings. Yeah, D&D. <laughs> D&D yeah. and Lord of the Rings. The same places that she got a lot of the the uh same the the beasts that are making an appearance in the harry potter series mm-hmm. yep so the politics um, and fantastic beasts are very frustrating but there yeah. are more frustrating things in fantastic beasts than just the politics Ooh, also the whole basic, thing has been frustrating <laughs> the romances let's talk about the romances <laughs> uh, it's a gay love story didn't know if you knew this but fantastic beasts and where to find them is supposedly a gay love story uh, so we'll start with the obvious one of the gay love story that exists here. And that is the queer baiting that exists here. Yeah. Uh, I said it once. I said it again. I'll say it until the day I die. The concept of we were closer than brothers as an acceptable way to introduce a queer love story. And that is at the root of this. Mm-hmm. So uh, the whole concept between why Dumbledore and Grindelwald can't fight each other is because they met when they were young kids and by young kids I mean like 16 they Dumbledore fell in love with Grindelwald I like to think Grindelwald had some sort of feelings for Dumbledore even if he's a psychopathic monster uh (laughs) they both were very anti-muggle uh and made a bond and a blood oath to not harm one another uh, and Grindelwald kept the physical evidence of their blood oath so that Dumbledore then couldn't harm him as Grindelwald gained power and continued to do more and more dangerous things. And as Dumbledore hypothetically's opinion changed over time. Yep. So uh, it's very it's very interesting because it's almost like in this third movie, they kind of saw the mistake of the brothers line and they're like, we're going to open the movie with a gay date. OK, you guys, you can't say we're, we, you can't say it's queer baiting anymore. They're on a date. They're on a date. What's you guys. more gay than tea? What's <laughs> more gay than tea? <laughs> so I remember when I was watching this movie for the first time and this is the opening scene and I was like, oh, maybe it's not as bad as I think it's going to be. Maybe it's not as bad as everyone says it is because like, oh, like. If they're on a date like they get it i was so wrong i was so wrong <laughs> no because it really uh, doesn't go anywhere 
there's really no like love so it also is like so gay of like it's happening inside their head and they're meeting in this like third party dream space instead of actually like in real life and there is a line of like let me see it when talking about like the blood oath sort of thing but i'm also like sir you're in public <laughs> you can't just demand something like that um stupid no it's pretty it's pretty terrible uh and yeah <clears throat> sure it's no longer queer baiting if you have uh a two queer characters sharing tea together um but, but we don't get anything from it like that's not even like what i explained to you and said about what the the story is isn't even explained in the movie Mm-mm. it's still hinted at the the only thing that makes you think that this is queer is that Dumbledore says I was in love with you. Mm-hmm. Everything else is nuanced. Everything else is hidden beneath the surface. And even then, Dumbledore, like, has no feelings towards Grindelwald. Like, other mm-hmm. than, like, we don't see any extreme feelings from Dumbledore at all, which I think is a character choice from Jude Law. I'm not mad at it. But Mads is also so... so unaffected in this scene too that i'm just like this is awkward (laughs) yep but that's not the only love story that we have that's kind of like um you know supposed to be taboo right like we have jacob and queenie's love story where they're not supposed to get married because one of them's magical and one of them's not this is very obviously a allegory for interracial or homosexual marriages right like the marriages that have been illegal in the past so We have their love story where they get together, they want to get married, but they don't get married. And and Jacob's um, reaction to this is, I want to keep you safe. Let's break up. This is not worth what could potentially happen to us. And And Queenie's Queenie's reaction reaction is, I'm going to drug you. (laughs) I'm then going to join the fascism, the fascist people that want to oppress you because they've promised me that I could be with you. Yeah, like I'm I'm willing to which, forsake everything else just to marry you, which that kind of that's kind also, of like it makes sense, but then here's the problem. Here's the problem with it. So Queenie does all of this stuff, and Jacob could not fucking care less. His reaction no. is to just say, You're kind of crazy, Queenie, which is true. And then she gets all super offended, but like he doesn't care. He doesn't care that he's been drugged, manipulated. He doesn't care that she went and helped out the fascists. Like he could not care less. And here's the deal. I'm a sucker for a toxic, messy relationship. <clears throat> and man, if it had, if the third movie had been played right and Queenie had like actually seen the error of her ways instead of just like, because that's the other thing too, is that there is, we don't see any of the growth from Queenie. Mm-mm. We see her agreeing to this and then we see her regretting it. We see nothing that in between that and Mm -hmm. if we had seen the in between of her like realizing like holy shit what did i do that would have been character growth and then she would have sat there and was like i made a stupid mistake you're absolutely right joining your oppressor is probably not the right thing to do but we don't we don't see any of that you're totally right so it it just it just ends up falling flat it just totally ends up falling flat. Exactly. Um, yes. So, and I, and I agree, like if they, if they would have stuck to their guns and been like, not nah, Queenie's, Queenie's a fash now. And like tried to have Jacob actually wrestle with that. And Queenie actually wrestle with that instead of just literally, you know, in the third movie pressing undo and being like, wish we wouldn't have done that. Sorry. Queenie's not fashy anymore. Um, yes. Then like, it maybe could have been like something interesting, but it's just boring. It's boring. And, then- and it doesn't even do what it's supposed to do. And then I'm also here, like, being, like, it also just was, like, not, it didn't hit the allegory. <clears throat> like, what would I think would have actually made it interesting is if they were an interracial couple. Because then, on the other side of, like, Jacob would have been feeling the pressure because that would actually, like, make sense as to why Jacob would be okay with breaking up. Her being like, oh, I'm going to break up because of your people punishing you does kind of make sense. But, like, he's not actually feeling any of that pressure. He cares about her, but there's no actual pressure on him. If they were interracial and he had the pressure on him of, like, the societal pressure from his side of things, that actually would have, A, not just been an allegory, it would have been a metaphor over an actual real thing. 
But Landon, we're not allowed to have main black characters unless they're there to get fridged at the end, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> How could we do that? <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly, exactly, Koneko. You you got you got there before you got there before we did. Totally, totally exactly um what what we believe oh, yes. could have been better for this movie. Yeah. So we are getting close to the 2 p.m. time. Um, we do have a couple of like really quick fire careless mistakes we told you this was a whole episode of spot the problems yeah. so there's it's a couple of episode. others that we would like to just mention really quickly um and there's some pictures of them so first one i would like to talk about is nicholas flamel so if you remember from harry mm-hmm. potter the, one this of the, the big <laughs> thesis statements in harry potter is that you should not try to seek immortality Okay, don't try to seek immortality it's bad for you okay people are meant to die so you should not be seeking that in your life. Um, this is supported by so many things in the books, right? Except now we have the Fantastic Beast movies and we meet Nicholas Flamel, who, as we know from the books, is the person that was like researching the um, the resurrection stone, right? So he's trying to prolong his life. Uh, philosopher, the, yeah, philosopher's philosopher stone. stone. Yeah, sorry, philosopher's stone. He's trying to prolong his life with the philosopher's stone, right? Um, and we meet him and it turns out, oh, he actually was successful in doing this which we knew yes but it wasn't shown but we didn't know any details of it right but now we know details he's like living his life chilling and he's kind of like he's kind of cool right and i think that this like totally undermines the whole point right because we learn that trying to artificially prolong your life is bad but not for nicholas so here's the difference between nicholas and voldemort and what this choice accidentally says is that if you try to prolong your life I tra- uh, transition, uh, uh, wait, uh, prolong your life. I mean, transition. I mean, prolong your life. If you do it in private, away from everybody, and you're very secretive and, and covert about it, it's okay. It's fine. It's chill. You're going to be, you're going to be okay. But if you try to uh, prolong your life, I mean, transition, I mean, prolong your life, I mean, transition, I mean, prolong your life out in public and actually try to like gather followers and friends and like say, this is good. And you should all be doing this too. That's bad. And you're going to get punished. That's what this accidentally says. It's kind of hard for me to like look at this and and not and not be like, oh, this is just another example of how J.K. Rowling doesn't think deeply about the choices that she's making for her characters and for her stories, and her bigotry just slips in. It just slips in, you know. It does. It, yes, <clears throat> I do. In the grand scheme of all the problems, this one is low on the list for me, mostly because I think it's a cute little thing and we do know I'm sure that, that was like, the intention in his, i'm sure that was the in intention. his he and his the wife have been living and <sighs> and upon the sorcerer's stone being discovered that is when he got his affairs in order and he and his wife chose to pass on um but i do think that like yes that says a lot <laughs> yep yep <laughs> yeah but that's not the only one. There's a couple of others as oh well. Oh my god! Um, I know that the, uh, the Lestrange about... family tree is that, yes. is that the next one you want to do? It's all yes. jacked. <laughs> it's so messed up. Okay, so we have again, and this is like this is where it makes me mad of like these like little connections to people. Um, and that the the other person is not even on my list, so I'm going to mention this with her as well. Uh, but like the the Lestrange family tree, we know the name Lestrange from uh from oh my gosh. What is her name? Bellatrix. Bellatrix Lestrange uh, from the fifth book on, who is a crazy fascist follower of Voldemort. Insane woman. Um, But we know that they're also one of the sacred 28. So they're a pure blood family who has never had any sort of muggles in their line. Blah, 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 blah. You you follow this tree, though, that's been brought up. The Lestrange family tree dies. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It dies. Uh, and the, there is a brother, but not a brother who's kind of related, who's not related. And it just is like, doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like one of those cool little tags that you put in there, but I'm like, why? Why'd they choose Lestrange? There are so many other sacred 28 families that are not fleshed out. They could have chosen that last name instead. Or like the whole idea of the sacred 28, like, is that this is the families that have survived through time. So why not choose a name that we know that isn't part of the sacred 28 that might have died out, like might have actually had this thing. 
of like, oh, this family died out. So Borgen and Burke could like just coming off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Like it's a familiar enough name to the mm-hmm. Harry Potter fans that who spot it would appreciate it, but it doesn't actually fuck with anything that has like been built in the Harry Potter future. Because if you're trying to convince me that this is the same universe where the entire Lestrange family dies in this movie, but we have a Lestrange family tree that's also dying in the Harry Potter books later on. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, so the strange family gets kaput twice in the Harry Potter world. Twice. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> what? And then the other one time that this happens is with fucking Minerva McGonagall. Mm-hmm. Another. Uh, this happens in the second movie again, where it's supposed to be this cute little thing, uh, where they're visiting Hogwarts and this very prim and proper instructor comes in and like you know and and Dumbledore calls her Minerva the issue being (laughs) is that and this is again Pottermore but all of the relevance that is supposedly Harry Potter canon everything that we've told been told that is Harry Potter canon at the up until this point Minerva McGonagall wasn't even born yet so how the fuck is she a teacher at Hogwarts teaching by the way while Dumbledore is teaching transfiguration not even a not even headmaster yet so she doesn't even have a job because she's only ever taught transfiguration but she's at hogwarts <sighs> makes no sense makes no sense and it's like it's like it's like they just wanted to be cute and they didn't think about what that meant at all all right when you start fucking with the things <clears throat> that we've been told are canon like at least nicholas philomel canon yeah, at least at they least didn't fuck up his plot. he was alive. <laughs> at least we knew he was alive, that he was an old man, that he was friends with Dumbledore. He didn't fuck up anything. <laughs> so stupid. Anyway. All right, we've already talked a lot about the chillin', so we can skip that one. But there is one other, like, little careless mistake that I want to bring up. And that's in regards to how they made Credence a Dumbledore. So they made Credence a Dumbledore by saying that Aberforth is his father. So the way that this is revealed to us is that he's Dumbledore's nephew, he's he's Aberforth's son, and that Aberforth essentially abandoned Credence as a baby or abandoned Credence's pregnant mother. It's not super clear, but basically that's what happened. And it doesn't really make any sense for the very tiny little bit that was established about Aberforth's character. So they totally ruined this character, Um, kind of like they mess up with a family tree because like- (laughs) Here's the thing. Yeah. He was in he was in opposition. Aberforth was in opposition to Albus in the books, whereas Albus is the person that, you know, wanted to sequester himself away and kind of run away from his problems. And Aberforth was like, no, you're kind of a dick for doing that. Why'd you abandon the family to go, you know, fuck around with your your boy political boyfriend or whatever? Right. I was here. Aberforth, I was here taking care of things. Oh, but we find out Aberforth has in his past where he did that as well. And it just kind of makes well, it like, what's the difference between the brothers so now? So my interpretation was that Aberforth didn't know. That it was like one of those things where Mary went away to boarding school for nine months and then came back looking great sort of thing. That it Aberforth could be. didn't That Aberforth didn't know. So like that I think was at least the interpretation I got because it was never really stated what happened. So my interpretation with that, but what that does mean is that that is like a trauma put on Aberforth of Aberforth's character has been holier than thou, has been, I have stuck around. And then all of a sudden in the past, that didn't happen. Whether he, like, and I think it's active, it's important to say that he didn't actively choose to abandon somebody, but the writers made him abandon somebody. Yeah. And so, and then so it's like, kind of, it doesn't it make, make it any make no sense. sense. It makes that he'd have a grudge. Yeah, so it makes because... his character in the books make no sense. So why does he act mm-hmm. like he does in the books? Now yes, it doesn't make any exactly. sense. Exactly. Or in the movies or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's, it cancels his entire character and what his thesis of it is. Because, like, also, I think that there's a level of, like, that could have still happened. And if Dumbledore found out that Aberforth's son was Credence and never told Aberforth, then of course Aberforth would still have that holier than thou, I never would have abandoned somebody sort but of thing. But that's not what happens. But that's not what happens. <laughs> they find like, out so there and are, they reveal it to Aberforth. Like, there it's are like ways boom, boom, boom. to write it to make mm-hmm. sense that they chose actively not to do. Yep. 
so another, these are just I a also few... wanted to oh, I also sure. wanted to talk about one more that was that I felt or two more that I felt were really important. The second one are they 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 uh argue about the governmenting of of uh how the wizarding world is governed with themselves in the beginning in the first movie there is a council of world leaders of magical world leaders gathering of all these different magical world world lever, leaders including the minister of magic of europe including all of these things from all over the world there's like 40 to 50 people in this room yeah, tons uh of tons of them huge amount of leaders then we skip to the third movie where apparently we find out all of the ministry of magics are connected so there isn't a minister for your for England and a minister for France and a minister for all these different countries. There is instead one minister of magic ruling all of magical Europe. And that or not even magical Europe, all of the magical world. It's implied it's the world. It's implied that there's like a world leader and then there's leaders of the individual countries, but that they're all under the world leader and the world leader is voted on. And we've never, never heard of this. This nope. was never even hinted to in any of the history that we've gotten snippets of. Like, like we've gotten so much history of magic snippets about goblin wars, but we've never once heard about a universal world leader. Illuminati uh, it's, confirmed. It, it, it's <laughs> never talked about in any of the other politics of Harry Potter, in any of the other movies. And so all of a sudden this election, I'm just like, who the fuck are you electing? And they are calling it a Ministry of Magic election. So it is Minister of Magic, which implies that all the Minister of Magics that we have known rule the world coming from Europe. That makes no coming sense. Coming from England. <laughs> yeah, but it can't be that if you look at what we learn in the books about how the magical um, governments work, right? Because they tell, they say in the books that they had to coordinate between multiple magical governments to make the um, the cup happen. The what is it? The, in the fourth, book, uh, the Triwizard uh, Tournament. Yeah, the Triwizard Tournament to make the Triwizard Tournament happen. Like it was a big old, it was a big deal to coordinate that with the multiple governments. So it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Um. And then also, is it, why the fuck did the chillin to choose Dumby? I don't know. Supposed to choose someone pure of heart, but we've witnessed <laughs> Dumby in these movies we just, we regularly watched, manipulate people. Regularly. We just watched two movies of Dumbledore manipulating people uh, for causes he felt justified to, not that were morally justified. So. <sighs> Manipulation's so good if if you're the person who is right in the eyes of the author. Mic drop. <sighs> <laughs> so, did it resonate? No, fuck no. I hate these movies. I hate these movies so much. Literally, there's there's a couple bits in the first one that I think had a lot of potential that I thought were cool. That's it. That's really it. Um, what else? No, they don't resonate at all. Even this, even the fact that I that I wasn't like too mad at the first one or anything, and didn't think it was that bad or anything, it still didn't resonate with me. I just thought it was kind of a fun movie. You know what? The first one, I, I it resonated before it had sequels. It no longer <laughs> resonates now that it has sequels. But before it had sequels, I was like, "There's a neurodivergent autistic man and his sh very socially awkwardly shy girlfriend, the mind reader." <laughs> sister-in-law and the bumbling war hero exploring new york city and trying to find answers to these monsters this is awesome this is great and then they had to go and ruin it and then they added two movies and ruined it no. so no so no. no uh i it doesn't resonate see i like to there are times where i get on these binge watches where i watch people react to movies that are either I find really good or also really bad. I would never watch anyone react to these movies because A, I don't like seeing people torture themselves and B, I don't want to be reminded that these movies exist and I have to in order to have that happen. Yep. Um, they really <laughs> just should have never been made. They should have just kept to the original plan where they made a singular Fantastic Beast movie and if they would have made a, a few more like singular movies that sit on their own like that, then they might actually have an alternative narrative in the press to combat 
you know, all of J.K. Rowling's disgusting turfery. Like that might or, that might happen, but they didn't. Yeah. Or they might have been like they might have gotten to the point where they could have been like, "Hey, Joanne, this has been successful, but why don't you sit down and shut up, and we'll continue <laughs> making you money without you having to do anything?" And she, they might have been able to convince the, her death claws off of anything Harry Potter. They would have been able to like pull Maybe. it off and just saying that the world might have been changed and Maybe. other ideas <laughs> might have been heard. Uh, maybe it's all maybe maybe i like to think that way but it didn't happen that way and so now she's gonna grip onto this with dear life and she's gonna be like you know what actually ruined all of this it had nothing to do with me it was a gay love story and that's the problem as I, we said it before we said it before like actually like over a year ago at this point that bigotries are comorbid do not be surprised no. if one day jk rowling starts tweeting things against um, you know, gay and lesbian people, not just trans people. Don't be surprised or, if one day she starts tweeting just straight up man hatred. Or, Don't yeah, be surprised. Racism, anything like that. Don't be surprised because they are comorbid. They are comorbid and she could. Her, yeah, she's absolutely <clears throat> right on the verge of starting to tweet actually racist and anti Semitic shit. Mm hmm. So yeah, no, it didn't resonate. Not at all. Um, anyways, that's our episode. <laughs> uh, next week, we're going to be talking about something much more fun. We're going to talk about the musical The Last Five Years, which has a movie version that is pretty um, accurate to the play. So that's fun. So a lot more lighthearted episode next week. Yes. Come and join us to hear all about The Last Five Years. It's one of Landon's favorite musicals. So that's why we're covering it. Yes. <laughs> If she's going to make me watch Death Note, I'm going to make her watch at least one musical. Yep, yep. Um, also, tomorrow I will be streaming Majora's Mask, so please come join me right here at noon tomorrow to get part two of the Majora's Mask stream. Also, all of my... Um, all of the VODs for all of the episodes you can find on my YouTube channel. So if you like this content, I do recommend subscribing to my YouTube. If you would like to keep up to date on what's going on with my streams, you want to be following my Twitter. And if you want to hang out with me or make sure that you get all your notifications, you want to be on Discord because I can actually control the notifications there. Um, you can support us in all of the ways. Uh, we, you know, you can do subs, uh, bits. We have a merch store. I have a thrown wish list if you would like. Um, but of course, for today, my recommendation would be do a donation to a organization that supports trans youth. Um, Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine or TikTok or Twitter. I'm no longer hiding from the students, so it's chaos over there. Uh, you're more than welcome to find me on there. Uh, sometimes I lurk in the cafe, but mostly I'm here almost every Saturday talking about fun media things with my friend Karen. Hey. Um, <laughs> fine. Uh, I, I had something else I wanted to plug, but it is not coming to mind right now, so I'll have to do it next week. Okay, next oh, week. Oh, this was it. This oh. was a also, uh, as a reminder, in March, and I think that we've, now, we've talked about this, but uh, just want to make sure it's out there, we're going to start reading and dissecting Hunger Games. So get on that and start reading so that you can have a fresh uh, pair of eyes on that book as we dissect all the things right and wrong about Hunger Games. Yes, and all so, three of the uh, Hunger Games trilogy are on Audible. So yes. if you are interested, you can do your 30-day free trial and get the first book right now. Yes, uh, and it's a good it's a good uh, Audible series. I actually have it in my library so that mm -hmm. my children can listen to it should they want to. Um, but it's it's a really good choice. So come out and do that with us in March. Yep. Yep. All right, you guys. So I am going to take just a quick break here in just a yes. moment to say goodbye to Landon and to get the Sims going. We're going to be doing our Sims 2 Legacy next. So um, to, to the YouTube, yeah, so to the YouTube VOD people, thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't also, forget to make it a great day. And I'll say my goodbye in just a second. But yes. Karen, guess what? what? We never have to talk about Harry Potter again. Never talk about Harry Potter ever again. Y'all, we're done with it. We're moving on. Don't forget to be awesome <laughs> bye